This video is about eBay's biggest ionizer with 10 outputs, but even if you're not interested in ionizers, you'll still find the circuitry in this very interesting because it's an unusual circuit, extremely efficient, and it may provide some inspiration. So the idea of this is that uh, when, in this case, this is a 220 volt unit, but I just tested in 120 volts, it works in 120 volts at much lower output, but will last virtually forever because the stress on the components will be a fraction of what it would be uh, on the 220 volt rating. Uh, but the idea of this is that you plug it into the mains and it creates a high voltage in the end of these carbon fibre bundles. And because they are a series of sharp points, the high negative voltage then goes into the air. It creates a charge in the air. And if you mount these, as they're often found in ducts through holes in the plastic channels of fans, there will be some path to ground and you'll get a tiny little bit of corona discharge. It will create trace levels of ozone as well, just for extra benefit. So this one came from eBay. There's a surprise. And it's described as AC 220 volt car air purifier. 220 volts in your car, very handy. Uh, air purifier, negative ion, ionizer, anion, generator, airborne modules. Anion, they often use anion. Um, uh, it was £5.51. Um, that is extremely good value. That was all inclusive. That's extremely good value for a module like this. It's kind of specialised. I shall tuck that out of the way. So, I often get asked how I depot these modules. In this case, I got a pair of pliers and I heated the case up and then gripped the edge of the plastic and twisted and that sort of breaks the plastic away. I then found that with the module you could actually spudge her down. This is another one. I'm not going to open this one because I want this one intact. I spudged another one open but you can slide that down and it it starts, it helps to start off by breaking all the outer plastic off, just using whatever force is needed once you don't stab yourself in the process. Once it's out, uh, I tried soaking the module in acetone. It went into a certain depth and then stopped. It wasn't very fast to actually do. I ended up using my heat gun and basically speaking, I'd heat the area that I wanted to do. Park this heat gun up there out the way. And then I took a knife Cain's knife. It's a, a maker knife by Giacco. Uh, and then paired away at it. And once it got hard again, then I'd heat it up. And it, it's very time consuming. Once you get down to the finer details, you can then use a little screwdriver to actually uh, just fine chisel into the details. Once the resin was out, I was left with this. And I didn't take all the resin off. There's a reason for that. Let me bring in pictures so we can see it much closer. So here is the top layer. This looks out of focus just because it's looking through diffused plastic. Uh, this is a 220 nanofarad uh, 400 volt capacitor. This is a high voltage capacitor, uh, rated 470 picofarads. Uh, there's a high voltage diode here, a very long high voltage diode, rated about 10 to 12,000 volts. And then there's a little... Uh, Thyristor here. The thyristor is an MCR 100-6. Very, very common. Super sensitive. Very easy to turn on. Really popular. Used in night lights and things like that. It's a dusk switch. The back of the circuit board is the most important bit to me because I can reverse engineer from a basic layout of stuff like this. Seeing the... All I needed was the placement of these components on the other side. A very rough uh, placement. I already guessed that was a thyristor that there would be a capacitor here going by the circuitry in the back, that this would be a capacitor and this would be a diode. It all kind of made sense. But uh, here we have the circuitry with the two incoming uh, connections. The first one going via a resistor and then diode. Uh, the next one going via two resistors because each one is doing different functions. Uh, and then uh, there is that uh, capacitor across here. I should draw that capacitor on. There's the thyristor here. There is the capacitor there. There's the high voltage capacitor. See the little anti-tracking slot there between these big pads here, but then it really closes up here and there's no anti-tracking slot. Minor technicality, but there is a capacitor here, the high voltage capacitor. They're relying a lot on the resin in this uh, unit. And then there's the high voltage diode, which uh, is going from, let me see, let me work this out. It's going a wave, so it's going like that, the high voltage diode, which is actually a stack of little diodes inside. Again, they've got the anti-tracking slot, which just stops dead without actually continuing along to here where those pads are in parallel. But I think they're really just, I'm not sure. They, they, that's how they did it. The output goes via this 
odd 20 mega ohm resistor, really not rated for like the voltages involved. And then it goes to this clump of just, these are all just parallel together. These, these literally just all are soldered straight onto that. And there's a little sort of notch out the corner of that, I think. Yes, there is. It's, but it's really just, it's a huge big clump. That's the, them all coming up off here, and then potted in resin. Strange. Is that got a gap through? Yes, it has. They've kind of cut out into that. But I didn't take the resin out there because I didn't need to. Right, let's go on to the schematic so we can see how this works because this one is using a pretty neat circuit. It's a common enough circuit. Um, but uh, let's zoom down this. The reason this is uh, actually... I drew this out on my notepad. Where is it? Is that it? I think that's it. I drew it on the notepad, but then I copied it onto this uh, cream paper because I want to draw in the current paths during various phases of operation. So what we have here is the incoming AC supply, and there are two current limiting resistors. They're the ones that limit the current uh, that's charging up this capacitor, and that's the capacitor that is used to dump a spike of current through the transformer here. So on one half of the main cycle, that capacitor is charged up. This side goes positive, this side goes negative. On the other half, this thyristor is triggered and it shunts him. And when it does, uh, the sudden pulse of current in, with the coil in series of the capacitor in a loop here uh, creates a magnetic pulse in the in coil that then gets transferred through very simple, just one capacitor, one diode to create a negative voltage here and then that 20 mega ohm resistor on the output. The 20 mega ohm resistor is odd. It's a safety thing. It's supposed to isolate you from the current path through to the mains. But in reality, uh, I, I think it's based. The, the value is so identical fundamentally to the original mountain breeze ionizers that used two 10 mega ohm resistors in series. And they used big resistors like, you know, like this, but actually 10 mega ohm. And the reason they did that was for extra voltage separation, you know, because they're rated for higher voltage. In reality, if you were to short the output out, it would dissipate a bit of power, but it's all very low power. So the voltage would clamp down to virtually zero across these. But mountain breeze used to use two because the higher voltage of these gave better separation. They've just used 120 mega ohm, and I see this a lot. It's very strange. This means that if you want to use this in an application where these are exposed to touch, I would recommend inside possibly just lop all these off except for one. Take that one to a couple of one mega ohm resistors, at least in series, one watt or two watts, something just that's going to have a high voltage rating, and then recombine it with all the cables so that basically speaking, uh, the output of this gets uh, lit, cu current limited by a couple of resistors that if you touch it, there's not you're not going to be relying on one surface mount component between you and a significant electric shock. Although having said that, there are at least two 18k resistors here, uh, which would help uh, reduce the risk of that. But again, they're surface mount. Anyway, let me show you the current path that happens. So because this is being fed with AC, it alternates positive-negative and then uh, negative-positive. On the charge cycle, this goes positive and this goes negative. The current flows through this current limiting resistor, through this diode, and it charges up that capacitor. The other side of the capacitor uh, is effectively via the coil. It's negative via this diode and this resistor. And technically speaking, that's also there. So that's the that part of the cycle. When it then changes to the other half, let me just... Uh, so at this point in time, uh, this is charged up positive. And this is charge negative. When this side goes negative and this goes positive, I'm just wondering if I was in shock for the other bit. That would be so annoying if I wasn't, but you'll have got the gist anyway, probably. Uh, what happens now is that to turn this thyristor on, the gate has to go positive with respect to the, uh, the negative terminal here. So it finds its negative from main supply via this diode, and that resistor. So that's connected to negative. The positive comes 
from this resistor here, which will limit its current to about one milliamp, and that's what's used to actually fire that. When it does fire it, the current suddenly, that will turn on suddenly, and there'll be a huge current spike around here, and that's what induces the current across into that coil, and then creates the high voltage over on the secondary side. It's a very, very, very simple circuit. It's refreshing. It's a, it's a simple, logical, um, and on the, even when you go back to this original picture here, when this is negative, it's effectively keeping that uh, thyristor really solidly off by pulling it to negative. It, it achieves a lot with a little. It's a very, very impressive circuit. So just in case I didn't actually take my fingers out of the way for any of that, uh, that's the, the charge cycle. And that's the discharge cycle. So I have been experimenting with this. I've got one of these uh, that I've cobbled together into something. Hold on, I'm just going to dig this out. I used it. Oh, I buried it. This was not part of the original video. This is uh, me just making stuff up a go along. I connected one of the outputs to the an ozone plate. I'm going to power this up. Screw it. What's the worst could happen? Well, an electric shock is the worst thing that could happen. But you know what? Things have to be done. Let's connect it in a dangerous way. Because this is effectively finding its current path to ground, if you want to use it as an ozone generated power source, uh, you have to use a connection to its uh, negative here. Well, it's neutral. Uh, so I'd recommend uh, using a resistor in line. And again, I'd recommend a resistor in line with this if this is going to be exposed. This was featured in another uh, video. And uh, you can download the files for that and get them made, manufactured. There are now two versions, just two different logos. The molecular destroyer. Now, I have to remember that these brushes here are all going to be live at high voltage. So I have to keep that out of the way. I'm also going to have to pick this up to let you hear it. So this is going to be precarious. I'll try not to get electric shock here, but you just never know what's going to happen. It's now running. Ah. And this, hold on. Yeah. Right, tell you what, I'll try and precariously lift all this up without getting a zap. And I'll hold it up for you to listen. You could probably hear the air blow past that. I did get a tingle, yes. That is not a surprise. Uh, right, so... Other things you can do with this. I think they are pushing these resistors quite hard, these little 18K resistors. I'll do this experiment right now. The 18K resistor and 18K resistor, they're, you know, they're going to get mildly warm. The power consumption of this, let me plug it in again and show you the power consumption without touching the spicy bit. Power consumption on the Hoppy is showing as 0.6 watts. God, it's so little. 3 milliamps, terrible power factor, but it's only half wave anyway. 0.6 watts is nothing. It's, you know, completely and utterly negligible. But when I put this resistor in series with the live, or I could put it in series with the neutral, and that would probably be safer. Let's do that. Let, let's be safe like that's something fresh for this channel. So I shall twist this wire on here, and basically speaking, that means this end's going to be actually live with respect to that, but not to worry, it's, it's fine. Uh, I'll just make sure I don't touch that. Uh, if I plug it in now, the current drops so low that the hoppy doesn't read it anymore. Let me just grab a hold of this and see if I don't get a zap. But I'll hold it up and you can listen to it. Uh, can you hear it hissing? I did a test and it still produced plenty of ozone, but adding that extra resistor in series takes stress off. Is it getting warm? Mildly warm. It's taking a lot of stress off the resistors in there. So by adding that resistor in, particularly if you're on a 240 volt supply or higher, could actually potentially make this unit last longer. It basically nudges it down. What actually happens in the circuitry there, if I grab that circuitry back, I add that extra resistor in, it doesn't really affect operation, but it does affect how much this capacitor is charged up. It may be that even with the, the you know, a fairly low, high-ish value of resistor, this will get charged up to the full point. Because keep in mind that on one half of the sine wave, it's being charged. The other half, it's being discharged. So 
uh, depending on how much current can flow through resistors will ultimately determine the voltage that ends up across that capacitor. But I think these resistors are chosen such that it's always going to end up fairly high anyway. So uh, adding an extra resistance in series doesn't really do too much harm and just tames things down. It makes things last longer. It just takes the stress off stuff. This is good. This makes electronics last a lot longer. But there we go. That is... Uh, shove that out of the way. This module. It's very good. It's, you know, what you get, because it's aimed at industrial applications, it's not a consumer thing. Uh, it does get, you know, it's cheap and it's fun to play with. But do remember that it all operates high voltage, but a low current, but mains voltage referenced. And that thing about if you decide to build this in a case and make your own mofo ionizer, I would recommend at least what I did there of uh, saying put one resistor in series with all these, uh, or indeed if you want to just break each one, you can put a one meg ohm or two one meg ohm resistors and a bit of heat shrink sleeve and just break each one. And uh, that will also kind of spread the current between them as well. But all in all, it says model MS-FA7000. wonder if that's uh, 7000 volts or something. Don't really know. Output 5 kV to 6.5 kV, so it might well be. But it's a nice module. It's interesting. Ideal for high-voltage experiments.